Okay, um, I hope you can see, uh, yeah, screen sharing. So can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Good. Okay, so um, thank you for the warm welcome, Marilyn, and uh, I hope you will enjoy the talk. Um, so uh, I just thought I'd give a little bit of background. Um, originally, when I was researching for my master's about modernist design in Melbourne, that's when I came across Frances Burke, although I, I did know her name, I'd heard it um, around, you know, growing up in Melbourne. And, um, and uh, so I, when I um, curated an exhibition for Heidi out of my master's research, um, I decided to... Uh, well, after researching Francis Burke's wonderful textiles, um, I used quite a few of them, plus um, uh, an earlier designer, Michael O'Connell, um, as two of the leading uh, designers of textiles in, in Melbourne. Uh, so I did a little bit more research for that exhibition. Um, and doing that, I, uh, one of the places that I did research was what was called then called the Francis Burke um, Textile Resource Centre, which was at um, RMIT. Um, it came out of the Fashion and Textiles Department and it was run, established by Robin Oswald Jacobs, who's, uh, and I met her then. I didn't um, have a lot to do with Robin, but she'd already, um, in uh, doing her research ma uh, masters into uh, Frances Burke's uh, work, life and business, um, she uh, had, um, you know, started um, uh, sorting out which were Francis Burke's textiles and who owned them and, you know, basically doing that really basic research of identifying and dating. Um, the good thing was too that um, as a young woman in um, uh, Melbourne and she'd studied textile design herself and she or had also met Francis Burke briefly um, and uh, when she was a student um, and then she decided she actually um, started interviewing Francis a few years before she died so she did uh, conducted about a dozen interviews with Francis and um, friends and so on so we came at it from quite different um, approaches and then um, I had this sort of idea in the back of my mind there should be a book on Francis Burke because um, she was a leading Australian modern designer uh, and uh, clearly Robin had the same idea and she'd retired and gone to live in the country and at the same time um, somebody saw her thesis and read a bit of it and said you know you're crazy you should publish this and so she decided to um, work on a um, work on a, a book and then she realized that it would be a very lonely long task as it is to write a book um, and she contacted me and said, you know, and that she was going to write the book, I think warning me off saying, you know, like, I'm going to write this book, so watch out. And I was like, oh, all right, as you know, any help I can give you, I'm happy to do so. And then we had coffee and then she, in the middle of it, she said, do you want to write the book with me? And I was, at that point, I was in this sort of transition myself of, of deciding whether to retire from, um, from teaching and you know, I sort of, that was one of my projects and I was like, actually, yes, that sounds like a great idea. So it was sort of like a bridging for me from academia into, into being retired, but still researching and writing and, and having a major project. Um, so the last two years, um, yeah, we've been full on, um, you know, doing re new research, um, writing and so on. So, um, so Francis Burke, um, I'll, uh, uh, so here she is um, in the late 50s and or early 60s um, with one of her famous textiles, Crete, um, which you can see in the background there. Um, so can you all see? Okay. Yep. Uh, and uh, so Francis Burke was... Um, Probably um, she was very well known. She started uh, designing textiles in uh, around 1937 and she continued in business, designing and running a successful business um, until 1970 and when she closed, closed her business and uh, then went into um, lots of advocacy, being on committees and so on. She already was on a few committees and um, organ in organisations and so on. But... Um, she uh, so it's an ex in Australian uh, design historical terms, it's actually a really, really long um, time to be in business because um, 
you know, a lot of designers start up and, you know, get a bit of success and then, you know, go out of business or, you know, they find it too difficult or they get bought out or like Clement Meadmore um, gave up in the end and, and um, what chose a career in fine art as being easier. And, you know, if anybody says, you know, if a career in fine art is easy, it's kind of, um, you can see how hard it, hard it was being a designer. So, um, so where did she come from? So the reason why I came to the Bluestone Cottage was um, to chase down this photograph because um, I wanted a photograph to show where Francis Burke came from. One of the interesting things that um, Robin and I were, or things we benefited from both when I did my masters and Robin did her masters and when Francis Burke was still alive, Trove didn't exist of course. And so there's lots and lots of information there that we've been able to get in the, you know, in the last couple of years, things that, you know, took months to find before and things that you would give up on, um, we were able to find. So uh, one of the things um, that was interesting was uh, a, a lot of the things that we started finding um, uh, broke some of the myths that Frances um, uh, put forward about herself. One of them was her age. <clears throat> she, um, she always said she was born in um, 1907, but in fact, she was born in 1904. So she took three years off her age, which is, you know, okay. But she also, um, <clears throat> uh, she, oh, I should mention too, that I was commissioned to write the, the Australian Dictionary of Biography entry for Frances Burke. And um, I put in, um, originally, you know, her birth date, which I understood from Robin's thesis, which was 1907. And um, when you do one of these um, dictionary of biography entries, they do, uh, you know, backup research. And they sent me this sort of swag of stuff saying, nah, she wasn't born then, she was born. Um, she actually, her birth wasn't registered and probably it was 1904. And they came up with this um, <coughs> court, uh, reporting of a court case where um, her mother was suing her father for um, maintenance for herself and Francis. Um, there were two older children as well. And uh, this was really interesting because she um, depicted herself as coming from a very loving home, uh, growing up in Parkville um, and going to um, Our Lady's Convent in North, um, North Fitzroy, a bit of in Fitzroy, sorry, but in fact, she went to local Catholic school. She was a brunny girl. And um, yeah, so she was very much, but in retrospect, looking at, you know, the kind of social values of the 1930s when she set up as a uh, designer of textiles and interiors and so on, she would have had to have kind of come from that sort of middle class, at least middle class background to have any credibility. Um, so I can kind of see why she fibbed about that sort of thing. Um, so her, uh, her father um, was a, um, worked in the um, clothing and textile industry um, and she um, said in interviews often that she always imagined that she would be around that world. But the interesting uh, thing was that, uh, in fact, she trained to be a nurse when she was younger. So she went um, from high school to study nursing first at um, Mount St. Evans, which was a private hosp Catholic hospital in um, the Victoria Parade um, Fitzroy, but later became um, part of um, St. Vincent's. Um, but she finished off at the Melbourne Homeopathic Hospital in St Kilda Road, which none of us would probably recognise, but it's where Prince Henry's was, which has also since been demolished. Um, and uh, it was a very large hospital, had over a hundred beds uh, and homeopathy. It sort of did conventional medicine and homeopathy. So um, that's a kind of an interesting um, aspect of it, I think. Um, so while she was a um, nursing, she met another young nurse through, uh, through family connections. Um, her name was uh, Fabie Chamberlain and they started sharing uh, a flat in Jollymont um, and they became um, close companions, life partners, um, soul sisters, who knows um, exactly what their relationship was. Some People of, uh, who were their contemporaries, like Anne Purvis of Australian Galleries, who knew them well, um, assumed that they were gay. Um, 
we don't know. We probably they were. Um, but anyway, the, um, so they met as young nurses. Um, Fabi wasn't so much artistic as musical. She played the piano, but they had a lot of things in common, but they also had separate friends and so on. But they started living together in their uh, 20s and um, stayed together their entire lives. Um, so in, um, uh, so in, so Francis finished training in the twenties um, and continued nursing. And then in 1932, her mother died um, and left. She must have um, improved her finances and she left her three children um, uh, 400 pounds each. Uh, and that was sort of like the equivalent of a, the a, a average annual male wage of the time. So that was quite a good amount of money for Frances and she already uh, could support herself through nursing. And so clearly she had an interest in art and she started, um, she signed up for classes at the Melbourne Technical College. This building, of course, is still standing. Uh, and she also started studying at the National Gallery School um, uh, basically doing night classes in drawing. So her, her sort of passion was more art than design at this point. Um, she continued um, nursing um, up through 33, 34, 35. Um, but in 1936, um, she started studying at the private um, Bell Shaw School in um, Burke Street. Uh, so it was around uh, around Queen Street, I think. Um, this is a photograph of um, George Bell in the in at the school um, from the State Library collection, and this is a, a photo of Frances from a private collection um, with her easel and her rest stick. Um, and in so in 1936, she she. She did learn drawing at the National Gallery. She'd done a whole range of different art and design courses. She got a scholarship um, after her first uh, yeah. semester at um, you go to the toilet as well? yeah. Melbourne Technical College. What? Um, and uh, she and also, yeah, started oh, these oh, classes. Oh, Sorry, Tully, it's a lady talking. Um, and uh, she started also, she quit uh, nursing in 1936 and started, um, she worked part-time at an advertising agency, um, just pretty much what they call uh, traffic. So um, organizing uh, for thing, where things went, you know, when a, a director, uh, an art director came in and wanted an artist to do something and she would make sure that it would then go on to be processed and to bromide it and then send it off to the printers and so on. So. Um, she did that sort of work. And I think that would have been a really good uh, uh, preparation for running her own business later on because uh, she under she got to learn about, you know, what's a brand and how to communicate that, um, what, what makes a, good, a successful advertisement and so on. We're not sure how long she worked there, but um, a few months anyway. Um, now, in Melbourne, uh, there was already a successful um, sort of... Uh, textile designer, Michael O'Connell, who was an artist, he was um, British. He, he'd um, come after the First World War. He was gonna be a, a, a farmer, but that didn't work out. He came to Melbourne and he sold uh, his watercolor paintings of landscapes. Um, he ended up marrying a local uh, young woman. Um, he was big in the arts and crafts society. Um, he was patronised by lots of society ladies. He used to, as well as um, paintings, he also started making um, concrete um, uh, urns for gardens and all sorts of sort of garden furniture, pots and, and so on. And he also started um, printing fabrics around 1930 or, uh, yeah, about 29, 30, 31. Um, one of the things that he was influenced by was the form, not so much the design, but the form of tarpa cloths and the way that they, they're broken up. So tarpa cloths are those, you know, made in Pacific Island cultures, New Guinea, parts of New Guinea, and um, so it's all throughout the Pacific, but usually beaten um, bark, mulberry tree bark, and, um, and then painted. And so used for clothing, for mats to sleep on, and uh, all sorts of things. Um, so, uh, but Michael O'Connell, Michael and his wife Ella O'Connell in 
1937, they decided to go to uh, back to the UK. They were going to go to the um, attend. Well, the, the 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 story, the official story, is that they were going to attend the coronation um, of um, King George. But um, in fact, you know, who knows if they actually attended the coronation or if they were, you know, they just there for the festivities and to catch up with family and so on. Um, but the interesting thing is from early 1937, so that kind of left a gap in the market and Francis Burke had known about, uh, Michael O'Connor used to teach at RMIT, uh, well, MIT, MTC as it was then, uh, and so she would have known about his fabrics, she learnt, probably learnt um, lino block printing herself, he used to print all of his uh, fabrics with lino blocks. Uh, and um, she, and you know, clearly he left and then um, so presumably she, you know, saw a, a gap in the market. So he left around February, I think. Um, and then by August, she'd, uh, she and a, a, uh, another young man who was um, uh, an MTC student um, established a business together called um, Burway Prince, so Burr for, um, for Burke and Way, he was, his name was Morris Holloway. Um, she often said that um, in, in, in lectures and interviews and so on, that she was inspired to uh, design by the fashion coordinator at George's department store. His name was um, Pierre Fornari. And this is one of the wonderful things of Trove. I looked, she said that he, um, he was uh, wrote an article in the Herald saying that um, uh, that Australian designers should look to indigenous culture for their ideas about design. And um, I can remember in you know the 1980s, I was like I went through the Herald. I thought for um, in 1937 from start to finish, but I must have glazed over when I turned the particular page because I could never find that damn article. But of course, it was Trove. I was talking to Robin when we were first starting and saying, if only we had that article. And it was like, hang on a minute. And I typed it in and it went, there's, there's the article, exactly. An interview with Pio Fornari. And um, of course, you know, we quoted in, in the book. So it was like, oh, bingo. Like, how, how great is this? Um, so um, Pierre Fornari, um, you know, commissioned some fabric from uh, Francis and then, yeah, that encouraged her to set up the business um, with um, Morris Holloway. Initially, I think they were both going to design, um, but in the end, he didn't do much designing and he ended up making his whole career into print out of printing um, other people's designs. Um, so this is a, a copy of George's Gazette from around 1940 showing a, a dress in a, um, a Francis Burke fabric and this is um, a copy of the actual fabric. So this is the, uh, what a lot of our book does is actually get the original historical examples of, you know, saying, okay, this is, this is where, you know, she, uh, so this is showing where her, her fabrics come in, how they're used. Here's an example. This is exactly the, the design that was used here. We've got the all putting it all together, which is um, a lot of fun, actually. Um, so, well, one of the things that I was interested in in the um, when I was writing about the 1930s. Um, uh, and when I uh, curated that exhibition for um, Tidy was uh, a thing looking at the whole Pacific um, influence that really sort of comes into its own in the 1930s. Um, and there's some reasons for that. One is that, um, as you probably all know, in the early 20th century, a lot of European designers and artists were influenced by African culture, by, you know, primitive um, or folk, folk art from Russia and um, so on, you know, um, Van Van Gogh was interested in a um, lot, you know, the Bre Breton people. Um, Gauguin came to the South Seas because he was interested in. So the idea of Pacific culture is, you know, is, has been part of the romantic sort of and the modern um, modern art and design. Um, so in Australia in the 1930s, there's a, a sort of increasing um, interest in the Pacific. One of the reasons is because the British Orient Line, uh, which is an offshoot of P&O, 
um, started doing cruises for more, not for the very, very wealthy, because up until this point, it was pretty much only very wealthy people who went on those um, cruises. But in the 30s, there was this idea of, you know, the sort of intermediate. So we had, you know, more middle class people could have, and the Orient Line set up specifically to cater to sort of more middle, the middle class market. Um, and so people started visiting, um, going on, on cruises and going to the Pacific Islands and so on. Um, another thing was that um, Australians were um, investing in, um, in Papua and gold, uh, New Guinea and the gold mining. So there was this sort of gold rush going on. So Australians were going up there and um, working in the, gold, in the gold mining industry. And so it was this sort of whole enthusiasm for the idea that the Pacific was this sort of new, new um, economic frontier, which is kind of really interesting because we don't tend to think about it in those terms these days. Um, and so very quickly, um, Maya sort of also started commissioning um, or buying from Francis, very much the sort of Pacific Island designs, like as George's had done. The interesting thing too, I need to go back to is, um, that Pierre Fornari talked about the Aboriginal, but in fact, you know, Francis didn't um, produce much in the way of um, uh, uh, Aboriginal designs at, at this in the, in the sort of late thirties. And it's not until around 1940 that it does come into her work. Um, and similarly, Maya, they're very interested in this whole, you can see here down here, um, Polynesian play and plunge togs and that, the, that they're uh, designed by Francis Burke and even the hand-printed hand tarpa design. So, um, so very much it's kind of, it's in this sort of, um, uh, you know, very fashionable kind of idea of resort wear and so on. Uh, another thing that influenced the sorts of designs that she made that, are, that comes out of the whole resort idea is the uh, marine. So, this, this one is called Yacht Race um, from 1939. And um, because in the 1920s, you know, Coco Chanel came, started introducing um, the sorts of things that, um, you know, uh, that sort of gentlemen sailors like her, her lovers, um, uh, she, I think it was Boy Capel had boats and, you know, they used to, um, a lot of the British aristocrats used to sail the yachts around and she liked the idea of the clothing and she made herself clothing and designed and um, sold clothing that had um, naval kind of motifs and, you know, things like white sailors, sailors pants, um, you know, sailor tops, the boat neck with the stripes. Um, you know, hats with pom-poms, all those sorts of things. So Coco Chanel sort of made it very fashionable in the sort of 20s and it kind of continued to grow and become more mainstream in the 1930s. Um, and also with Fra uh, Frances Burke, um, she also um, did some um, uh, aeronautical designs. So this one's called Windsock um, and it was very much, um, it was commissioned uh, for um, May Casey, late, later Lady May Casey. So May Casey, um, uh, has anybody heard of May Casey? I think you, a few of you would have. Um, she was um, married to a um, UAP, United Australia Party Pol Pol Parliamentarian. Um, Richard Gardner Casey, who later the UAP became the Liberal Party eventually. Um, and May Casey was um, very interested in art and she had studied art in um, London. And when she came back, they came back to Australia in about 1931, I think. Um, uh, and she uh, started studying at the George Bell School and that's where she and Francis met. And, um, they had a, an affair. Um, May was want to have affairs with women all over the place, um, as well as being married. Um, and uh, they remained close for even though the affair petered out fairly quickly, they became close friends and would ring each other every day um, until until May uh, uh, passed away. Um, so this is May and her two children and her, uh, the plane that she, she used to pilot herself. So, you know, um, aviatrixes uh, were very big in, in the 1920s and 30s, um, as sort of heroic women. And, um, and so, yeah, uh, patterns with planes were popular. Um, so 
first of all, um, Morris Holloway and um, Frances Burke used to um, started printing in her flat that she shared with Faby in Jolimont, but quickly they realised it was it wasn't ideal, and um, they got a, um, a space in this building here, Stallbridge Chambers, which is still in Little Collins Street up near William Street. Um, and it was on this level, the sixth floor, this top level. Luckily, it did have a lift because a, <laughs> a lot of people say, oh my God, carrying bolts of fabric and, you know, um, uh, dye and that sort of thing up there would have been difficult. And it's interesting because it uh, it's a chamber. So it's a, a primarily a legal building. And I thought, I kept thinking it was weird that um, why, um, why was she, what was she doing up there in a legal building and kind of away from the um, fabric and textile industry. And I can't, I thought it was weird. Uh, anyway, I sat down one day with the, um, that's about when, not long after we started with the uh, Sands McDougall directories. Um, at Melbourne Uni where you can sit there and flip through them and um, uh, I've, I've looked at who the tenants were and the major ground floor tenant of the building was um, was a firm of solicitors um, and the the surname was um, Chamberlain um, the same as uh, Faby her her um, friend uh, close friend and or lover and um, yeah so I think it must have probably been a, a family connection there um, so um, during um, when the war broke out uh, there were already quite a lot of um, restrictions on you know what sorts of um, uh, imports you know during the depression the Australian government put very strong import tariffs on all sorts of goods um, and which was good for Australian designers and manufacturers, probably not good in the long run, but good in the short term. Um, and during the war, the, there were further issues. Um, so um, companies were not allowed to import um, printed fabrics. Um, and so this made it a uh, wonderful uh, business opportunity for Frances Burke. Um, so she'd been doing quite well um, exhibiting at the um, Arts and Crafts Society of Victoria um, and, you know, printing her stuff. And then, of course, you know, people can't get, um, you know, the latest modern designs from London and so on. And so they were, um, and here she has, a, you know, she's producing all this wonderful um, fabrics with wonderful col modern colours and so on. And so she started um, exhibiting more widely. This is from a David Jones in Sydney. So around 1940, she starts marketing um, up in Sydney, um, getting her, her stuff represented and also um, in all over, all throughout New South Wales and uh, Victorian countries as well, country towns as well. Um, she also uh, sold fairly quickly to in Western Australia and also in um, Brisbane. Um, so in Perth and Brisbane, Adelaide took quite a while to um, accept her fabrics. So another area of does her design, she was interest, interested in, in um, uh, flowers, leaves, fronds, anything sort of natural. Um, and you can um, also see these really interesting patterns, which, you know, coming out of that sort of block um, tarpa cloth idea and then developing that with a kind of um, in instead of straight lines into these wiggly lines and then you get a flower and a, bit, a motif this is sort of a bit like that um, Michael O'Connell um, approach as well um, and this canna leaf one was one, one that was very um, successful um, 1939 and I think she was still printing it in the, in the 50s but in different color um, sometimes uh, just a single color and sometimes with an extra um, color. There's a really nice one at RMIT um, Design Archive in a deeper blue with or sort of magenta streaks here and there, which is really terrific. Um, and then, um, so during the war, Frances did really, really well. Um, a little bit after the war, she um, did things like she bought a car, she um, bought some land in Anglesey, um, and so she clearly, um, she also later uh, bought some property in South Yarra. So she clearly did really well financially um, out of the war, which was, but immediately after the war, it was difficult because they um, got rid of um, some of the tariffs and also um, imported goods came flooding in and people, her stuff wasn't the latest, absolute, you know, um, most fashionable thing 
uh, as much anymore. Um, so she was having trouble selling to the suppliers. Um, and so she decided to open up her own um, showroom office and shop in Hardware Street um, in, uh, in the city. Um, and this is a, a photograph uh, showing the interior. Uh, with some of the fabric. So you can see the Crete again that I showed in that first slide. And um, this one's called Wavy uh, Stripe. There's this huge uh, polka dot design as well. Um, and it's interesting because this, uh, she had this shop and then her printing studio was in the building across, um, across the street. And of course, though, those uh, buildings are still there in central Melbourne. Um, so in the post-war period, Frances um, really consolidated um, what she did um, by retailing for, her, her, for herself. Um, she also um, started, or she also had started in the 30s um, even, um, supplying Marion Hall Best um, in Sydney. So Marion Hall Best was a, real, a leading interior decorator um, in Australia uh, who had a shop and also a consultancy, very successful consultancy. Um, and so um, you can see here, this is her um, new design um, business. So she, and she's the fact that she's um, distributed through David Jones um, and also Marion Hall Best meant the sort of very, um, the be very best kinds of places that she was selling through in uh, New South Wales. Um, and this particular design is uh, Totem, uh, which is a really nice uh, design. It's something that comes in various versions. A lot of Frances's designs, she would ne she didn't leave things as they were. She'd change them over time. Sometimes this only has two rings. Um, sometimes these lines are thinner. Sometimes they're thicker. She sort of, you know, would shake it up and vary it and change her colours over time. Uh, so another thing that happened um, immediately after the war, it was travel, uh, international travel was possible. Um, and so she started to travel every year for the first five years. So from, I think, 47 um, uh, to 52, she went, pretty much went overseas. Every, and when she came back, she would be interviewed by the press and she would give lectures. And so she wasn't just someone who designed fabrics and sold them. She also became a sort of doyen of modern taste in, in Australia, but particularly in Melbourne, but also Australia wide. Um, that's one of the things that we were able to find out through Trove that there's just articles all the time. So the, a lot of the articles uh, reporting what she'd found uh, abroad were syndicated. And so they'd turn up in local newspapers all over Australia. Uh, another thing that she did, which was very strategic, was that she made friends with architects and um, they in turn commissioned her to produce things. Um, so an early um, collaborator was um, Roy Grounds, um, who of course designed the National Gallery of Victoria uh, in St Kilda Road. And this is a block of flats called Quamby, which is still uh, there. So you can see this, um, you, the road's actually right down. It's very hard to see it from this angle anymore, um, unless you had a drone, but um, you can see it from the other side. Um, and um, these were kind of like bachelor flats, mostly one bedroom, um, but interesting. They had, you know, little um, sort of office alcove in the, near the front door and then um, the, a, a kitchen and a bar here. Um, and so Francis uh, reportedly designed uh, this fabric, uh, Ranga, which is clearly, you know, uh, influenced by Aboriginal uh, uh, culture, um, to design for this, um, this curtain to cover the kitchen um, alcove. Uh, and so she got a real lot of publicity for this um, particular design. Um, and yeah, we saw it earlier on at, um, in um, uh, that exhibition at David Jones, which was curated by Marion Hall Best. Another uh, leading architect who liked her work and um, had a lot to do with her was Robin Boyd. Um, so this first image is the, one of the bedrooms in the House of Tomorrow. So from the 1949 Ideal Home Exhibition at the Royal Exhibition Buildings in Melbourne. So the Ideal Home shows, you know, we think of them as kind of normal, but they're kind of, they were sort of, this, is, this was the initial one after the war. 
and it was the House of Tomorrow was designed by Boyd um, as a modern flat roofed um, small but modern house. Um, you, people couldn't walk around inside it, they could only peer in through the windows because um, it, it, was, it was this very temporary structure. Um, but you can see the bed here is uses her wavy stripe, not sure what colour it was in. Um, but the colours of the house itself and all of the interiors were part, one of the things that people at the time found really fascinating and shocking. It was apparently the exterior was sort of purple and um, green, um, but we don't know exactly what shades of purple and green, so kind of interesting. Um, and then uh, the 1952 um, Ideal Home Show, the, um, they put up these two different rooms, while, which were called the good taste room and the bad taste room. And I don't know whether you can guess which is which, but clearly uh, Francis ended up in this one with the Featherston chair and the um, uh, practical PEL uh, um, furniture. So, and yeah, the lovely modern painting as, as well. So um, another architect who, um, who Frances um, supplied was um, Guilford Bell. She did a whole um, marine series for the Hayman Island Resort, which was uh, commissioned in 1949 and completed in 1952. Um, and so Hayman Island, you know, we think of it as kind of a bit, you know, middle of the road, but um, it was the absolute epic, you know, is amazing. Uh, resort at the time it was very luxurious it was very influenced by American um, uh, hotels and resorts and so on and Francis was commissioned to do a whole um, lot all the all of the furnishing textiles um, and she designed this particular one sea piece for it was for a public area a, a bar and apparently there was a glass wall and it was hanging along the wall um, uh, other ones she did which were used in the bedrooms um, and the interesting there's a, a lecture that she gave in 1980 and uh, RMIT has a copy of the the lecture and in, in it she said she says well everybody said you must have had a wonderful time going up there to Hayman Island to get all these ideas and she said I didn't even walk outside my studio um, apparently um, uh, Guilford Bell walked along the beach and picked things up in a sack and then have it, had it shipped down to her as inspiration, like mouldy old sponges and, you know, very rotting fish and <laughs> rocks and, 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 a, and a few dead flowers and stuff like, by the time I got to her in Melbourne, but yeah. Um, and this is another one, which is, I think, a lovely design. There's a, um, we'll be using in the book a, a version of this in Chartreuse, which is just absolutely gorgeous from um, the Ararat Gallery collection. You can see it in the room here. So there was a hotel with rooms, but there's also sort of cabanas, which were two rooms that had a you know a shared wall um, that people could stay in. So I think this is one of the cabana type rooms. Um, so also um, in the post-war period, um, Francis Burke um, claimed to have design, um, provided uh, textiles for 15, 16 um, Melbourne hospitals, but also hospitals all over Australia, um, including the Queen Elizabeth, the second hospital in, um, in Adelaide uh, in the 50s, uh, Darwin, or Mildura Hospital, um, Hamilton, hospital and uh, so this is uh, Peter McCallum Clinic uh, from which was an old building but was redecorated in 54 and this is um, one of Francis Burke's fabrics uh, from there and also the Margaret Coles house of the Alfred Hospital so it's a baby in a humidicrid of the period um, with this design here um, uh, of uh, koalas and uh, ferns. Uh, another um, architect who liked her work was Dr. Ernest Fuchs, who was um, uh, an architect and town planner um, who worked with the Housing Commission. He was a, um, had studied in Vienna and he's a very uh, well-respected modernist um, architect. Um, so this is his own office in Caulfield. Um, and this one on the right is uh, a house in Beaumaris. So typical of those um, lovely modern um, houses in Beaumaris in the post-war period. Um, the same design here in a, uh, in a green, deep green color. 
and um, with the butterfly chair. And you can see here the Clement Meadmore uh, string stools. Um, I'm not sure, uh, they look like uh, Featherston chairs, but I'm not sure that, that they were. Um, so, uh, and uh, this is a photograph of Fab uh, Frances and her partner Fabie in London, um, either in the late 1940s or mid 1950s. Frances mostly went to America on her trips abroad um, to look for style and, and uh, design and to talk about when she got home. Um, but she didn't make, uh, after a while she started going to Europe. Um, she loved Italy, but she only went once, uh, once or twice. Um, but America, she would pretty much every trip she went to the United States um, and she was very, um, she had friends there and um, she would learn a lot. She would go to Chicago and go to a thing called the Merchandise Mart, which was a huge um, wholesale um, and retail place, space that um, was apparently a whole Chicago city block of interiors, furniture, everything. Um, uh, this is uh, a photograph of um, promotional photograph uh, of her work, pro probably set up for an exhibition. And uh, it's her a design called Surf, some Meadmore lighting and some um, Beko lights, very characteristic of Melbourne uh, design of the period. And but with an Eames fiberglass chair, which uh, she claimed to have imported. I'm not sure that she imported it herself, but anyway, it was a, a quite unique. Um, uh design in around 1956 not very many people had them so you know she was using the latest of design to kind of um, promote what she was producing um and you know around the 50s you know mid 50s she was kind of ubiquitous you um, can see here um 55 56 she's getting covers this is that same uh, surf plus squares um, and this is that um, totem motif that I showed you earlier. So um, she's turning up in advertisements on covers and so on. Um, another thing that's interesting about Frances Burke is um, in one way, it's kind of, you know, not very unusual. I mean, in the twenties and thirties, um, people often um, had brands that were kind of personalized that were based on the person. Um, so, um, so one of the ways that she kind of established her personalized brand and carried it through to her goods was um, on the selvage mark. So she put her name on her sig hand signature on the, on the side. Um, and uh, this is one of the ways that you can recognize her fabrics if you see them in op shops or you wonder about them um, and so on. Um, she often has, but how she actually what she puts on the side varied from time to time. There's lots of different marks. Um, we've sort of collated at least 13 different kinds of selvage marks. Um, and some of them are related. Some of them indicate um, time, like um, in 1958, she her, her business started tailoring off a bit and she introduced this thing called unit color design. So, um, Basically, she wasn't selling as well, uh, we figure, and she started to, uh, she came up with this concept where there were a certain number of her designs that were tried and true that she kept on producing year after year. And she chose a, a bunch of colours and, and she would, so people could go, um, could get these uh, special designs and they could, and they could get them in a 48 inch width because up until then she was mostly doing 36 inch wide fabric, um, even though it's for furnishings. Um, and so the interesting thing is that she, um, yeah, she, she started offering this unit color design. So it's a way of kind of slightly dropping her price, um, but keeping the price up on new designs. So it was a kind of quite a, a interesting strategy. And it did keep, it seems to keep her in business for at least another 10 years. Um, and yeah, I mentioned advertisements. So this is Anderson's, a furniture, furnishing company. It had about six or seven different shops throughout Melbourne and in Geelong. Um, and also Descom, which was a Sydney company that produced, you know, latest imported and local designs. Um, and this is again, um, one of her fabrics. So she was used quite a lot. Um, so, 
I mentioned that around 1940, she started doing um, some Aboriginal influence design. So she's known for that. There are other designers, like there's a company called Annan in Sydney, in Sydney that started off in 1941 and went through to 1954. They are probably at around 40 to 50% of their designs were based on Aboriginal designs. But Frances Burke, um, you know, she, Probably it's not a smaller amount. It's probably, you know, 10, 15% of her output, although she did produce a lot of um, table, uh, table mats, napkins, um, tablecloths, uh, tea towels, and so smaller items with Indigenous. And they um, started, but she, they were sold as souvenirs during the Second World War to uh, American servicemen. So it's gonna be interesting to see if they pop up in, in the United States. Um, we've heard from somebody in Canada who has some. Um, uh, and uh, so that, that kind of um, continued through the 1956 with the Olympics. It was another sort of surge of activity with the indigenous ones, but increasingly she sort of moved towards these more reductive kind of uh, abstract designs um, and uh, that are very, I think, very um, strong and very um, successful that, that um, you know, a lot of times I've shown them to architects and they go, oh, well, I would use that now, um, particularly this, this one and this one here. Um, and this is uh, Frances towards the end of her life when she was uh, towards in sort of early 60s when she's sort of moving past, uh, moving more into um, uh, uh, interior, doing a bit of interior design consulting and not so much designing. She sort of increasingly didn't um, uh, produce new designs and started um, selling, um, using other people's designs as well in, in her work. Um, but she did still come up with interesting designs. This one's called Mosaic, um, which is pretty um, interesting and uh, modern design. So, um, so in the final years, uh, she closed her doors. Um, she'd moved her sort of shop and consultancy around the city. It went from, you know, from uh, Little Collins Street to Little Burke Street to Hardware Street to Little Burke Street to Flinders Lane, up and down Flinders Lane, Little Collins Street behind George's. Uh, then it went back to Flinders Lane and then out to Richmond. Um, and she had a couple of different places in Richmond. Um, but eventually she closed the doors in 1970 and she pretty much focused on just painting, uh, having a lovely time. Uh, she was on committees. Um, the um, Design, you know, the forerunner of the Design Industry Association, the Print Council, um, the Craft Council. She went to um, uh, to Asia and also to um, Mexico as the as the um, le uh, uh, representative for the Australian Craft Council. Um, and so she had quite a, a productive and busy um, uh, time. And she also was. Um, got lots of um, recognition late in life. She, she was a, well, the only uh, first designer to get an MBE. And she also um, was, a, was the first designer to be awarded an honorary doctorate in Australia from RMIT. So um, that's um, kind of a quick overview of all things Francis Burke. So I hope you enjoyed it and you've got some questions for me. <laughs>